wait. Uh, should we just do Damien walk us through here? Not a whole lot of changes. I think we've agreed to just about everything. Sure. And I apologize for the two colors. Um, got to correct that after I realized that it wasn't two colors, and so Amy got the two-color version of this. There are um, actually three colors if you include the yellow. <laughs> yes. So that that was, usually I like to do like a, a color and then a white. Um, but anyway, since we've got a lot of people splitting hands this morning, uh, the yeah, for some reason it, it split the formatting after the third section, so anyway. Uh, if you're going through here, I apologize for the microprint. We just got bigger copies to hand around. Um, the, just to kind of refresh everyone as to where we're at, first, second, second section, third section. Um, actually, let me back over here. Um, so the first, second, and the second section give authority to the Attorney General to enforce, uh, investigate complaints that an employer has committed a willful, substantial, or systemic violation of the uh, employee misclassification provisions in workers' comp and unemployment insurance law. They are the same between the House and the Senate. The third section here, um, this is disclosure language that's necessary uh, for unemployment insurance purposes if the Attorney General is going to uh, potentially enforce certain complaints. It is the same between the two. The fourth section uh, adds Attorney General uh, enforcement of misclassification for purposes of wage and hour law. It's the same between the two. Um, the same category, uh, willful, substantial, or systemic violation are applied throughout, I should, should note. The fifth section here uh, allows sharing of information uh, related to an investigation with the Attorney General for purposes of wage and hour. That's the same between the two. The sixth section uh, 387, this is also related to wage and hour law and allows enforcement by the Attorney General. The reminder as to why we have two sections that allow this is because somewhere in the mists of time uh, and its great wisdom, uh, this body decided to split wage and hour law into two uh, chapters. So, uh, when we do this chapter rewrite, we'll take care of We We could. Or, I could just leave it. Yeah, I mean, it's at this point, everyone's been familiar with it for 45 years. So um, one end deals with how you actually pay the wages to a person. The other deals with what the minimum wage and overtime provisions are. Uh, section 7 uh, allows for uh, disclosure of tax records um, by the commissioner of taxes to the attorney general. The same between the two. This is again necessary for the Attorney General's enforcement, potentially. Section 8 is the same between the two. It requires uh, cooperation with the Attorney General and memoranda of understanding between, or a memorandum of understanding between the AG and the Commissioner of Labor as to how they'll share information and so forth related to the enforcement. Uh, section 9. And this is the first spot where I'm going to note that uh, whatever you pass out of here will need a, an updated date. Um, this is a report back on the enforcement of employee misclassification by the Attorney General. It is the same between the two bills. Section 10 would create uh, in statute the Employee Misclassification Task Force. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that is still, uh, it exists already by executive order, um, but it hasn't met in a while, is that correct? Okay, I'm looking over at the folks from the Department of Labor who confirmed that it hasn't met in a while. Um, but this would codify it um, under the chairmanship of the Office of the Attorney General. Um, the only. Just go back yeah. to one question, Chris. It was sort of just the 
Let's just keep my memory refreshed. I think the heart of this bill was the, the referrals of two separate occasions or five employees. This is on section eight, uh, subsection three. Um, if there are, if the Department of Labor has found misclassification in two instances, uh, they would refer it to the Attorney General, correct? Yeah, so my, it's... My, my question, I'm sorry, do, do those instances of finding a misclassification have to be substantial or willful, or could it be a vanilla case of misclassification? So the way this is worded is this, this is an automatic referral if the uh, employer is engaged in just any sort of employee misclassification on two separate occasions in the past five years or has misclassified five or more employees. And if I reach back in my memory, I believe the discussion with the conference committee last year was that this was kind of setting a basis for what might be systemic. Um, I just want to refresh my memory. I know we right. agreed to it. But. Right, and then beyond that, they'll they'll work out in their agreement when the willful, systemic, or uh, substantial trigger is reached in other instances where it might not meet that automatic trigger. And before we go any further, I just have a question on ten where you were. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say it was. Ex uh, set up by executive order, whose executive order, and when? Oh and when gosh. was the last time? Not Probably. just, Probably. but it was under Shumway, right? Yeah. And it, it has uh, met on and off over the years, um, so. 2013? 2012? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So it, it's, the task force has met on and off over the years, um, more recently, uh, for those of you who remember the misclassification report I submitted yes. last year, the uh, department has been working one-on-one -on -one with agencies to address it um, because of difficulties in getting the whole task force to convene uh, to discuss something that relates to only two or three agencies. And so they, they don't meet because it's too big of an octopus to pull together? I mean, there's too many people? Uh, and it's... The, the department's testimony, and I'm paraphrasing okay. and don't want to speak for them, but their testimony last year was that they were, they were having more success one working one-on-one on one or, or with just two or three other agencies to focus on Got specific it. issues rather than trying to get all, whatever it is, eight or ten members together. Got it. So we have our big difference of opinion between four times per year, is that the next thing, and quarterly? We gleefully see to your position. <laughs> yeah. If all conference committees could have such thorny issues to iron out. Yeah. This is, that is the one issue in here, is whether they meet quarterly or four times a year. So. All right, so quarterly it is. 16 and the next one. All right, so the next section is, um, 11, 12, 13, and 14 are all sections repealing um, the provisions that uh, put the task force in the statute and give the Attorney General enforcement authority. This repeal, I believe it, uh, the Senate version has it on January 1, 2024, or July 1, 2024, um, and the House is a year later in 2025. Uh, but otherwise, the repeals are identical. So we can move ahead to section 16, um, where the Senate version requires adoption of rules. Um, it have oh, and now. this is actually obsolete. So this mm -hmm. section, there is a difference in the wording, but the, these rules have been adopted. They were adopted 15 days earlier than the committee of conference was asking. Um, so. Whole section. Congratulations. <laughs> yep. So sex, section 16 can just be struck. In section 17, the House had language around the Workers' Compensation Administration Fund, 
My understanding is that this language is no longer necessary, that the department has gotten uh, supplemental in the budget, right? I'm seeing a nodding head from uh, Jess on the side here. So that can also be struck. Section 18, this is the study of workers' compensation um, for state employees with post-traumatic stress disorder or uh, other mental conditions. Uh, this has a date that would need to be moved out, um, but otherwise it's the same between the two. Section 18 in the Senate, 19 in the House, is uh, the development and dissemination of information materials to educate workers and employers regarding the ability of a worker to receive workers' comp for the cost of prescribed over-the-counter medications. Um, and again, that was required by, would have been required by last October 15th, so that date will need to be pushed out uh, by a, a year. So, um, but otherwise the same. Section 19 and 20, uh, same between the Senate and the House. This is in the workers' comp uh, provisions and allows claimants to elect direct deposit as a payment method. Um, and requires employers or their insurance carriers to notify the claimant of their right to payment by direct deposit. Uh, section 20 in the Senate, 21 in the House. Uh, this is a cleanup here in the unemployment insurance. This, the former law required the uh, employers to post and maintain printed statements of the Employment Security Board rules uh, in places that were readily accessible. And this is now being updated to say an employer shall post notice of how an unemployed individual can seek benefits in a form provided by the commissioner in a place conspicuous to individuals. Uh, and it has to also advise individuals of their rights under the Domestic and Sexual Violence Survivors Transitional Employment Program which is the complement to UI for individuals who are unemployed because of domestic or sexual violence. Uh, so this is really updating the law to reflect what employers do, which is post a, put up a poster notifying people how they can get benefits rather than providing a copy of the rules, which um, they're difficult to get through even if you're an attorney. So. My understanding is that this happens a lot. And that, that may have. Um, I see the department nodding their heads. So um, this here, you still would need to update this because it provides a posting requirement. Um, so I think there, but otherwise I think everything has already happened. So it's just bringing the statute into line with what the department's done. Uh, section 21 in the Senate and 22 in the House is a period of dormancy for the short-term compensation program. What this is essentially is it causes the short-term compensation program to stop functioning until revived by the General Assembly or the Joint Fiscal Committee. Uh, for a reminder to everyone, the short-term compensation program is a program that uh, basically provides UI benefits uh, when employers cut back on their employees' hours in lieu of uh, laying them off. It has not been utilized recently because changes in the unemployment insurance law have made it uh, less attractive than just going through the program for, is it just regular benefits now? Um, so the way the law works right now, it's not needed. Um, but the idea with the period of dormancy is rather than <coughs> repealing it, um, so that you then would have to pass a new new bill. Uh, you're just making it go dormant uh, until such time as it might be needed again. Like another recession. Exactly. If there's another recession, it may be uh, advantageous for employers to have it, and then it's there and can be revived uh, either through a very short bill by the legislature or by the Joint Fiscal Committee if the legislature's not in session. Right. Okay, section 22 in the Senate and 23 in the House would revive the self-employment assistance program, which lapsed in, was it 2017? Yeah, so it, it lapsed in 2017 uh, through a sunset. Um, so this would bring it back. Uh, 
if you'll remember, historically it was underutilized, um, but the thinking was that that was because not many people were aware of it. Um, so this is uh, married to Section 23 in the Senate and 24 in the House, which is a report on the use of the program um, so that a long-term decision can be made on it based on its use after the department's implemented it with um, better information rollout than happened in the past. Can you update us on where this is? Because it strikes me that until they market it, no one's going to know about it. I mean, the self-employed people aren't going to know about I, it unless it's seriously marketed. I, I can't provide you with an update, but Cameron Wood might be able to. Uh, Cameron Wood, for the record, it, the program doesn't exist currently because it was sunset in statute. So we, we don't market it because we can't actually. You don't uh, have we don't have the authority to actually administer the program. So this brings it back, and does it charge you with marketing it or just studying it? Um, we would bring the program back, and I think our hope is to um, you know, do as best a job as we can of letting individuals know that it's available to them um, through you know, whatever means we can. I think just doing a better job. Well, your marketing. public service announcements, DOL had a series of public service announcements on BPR, which I actually heard. I thought, go! DOL. I mean, it, it's the first outreach that me, Joe Schmo, who doesn't actually uh, heard you our, outreaching. Um, this uh, commissioner, our former commissioner, has done a really good job of trying to uh, ensure that we are doing a much better job of marketing ourselves. Yeah. Jeff has done a lot of work in that area, along with our communications team and Amanda. So, so trying to do better. Could this be something that would be given to people who go to un un unemployment seeking direction? It would be for individuals who are eligible for unemployment, but choose to start a business as opposed to seeking for work. But, or and they so, could do the both at the same time. To In theory, they could. Yeah. I mean, that's um, the whole point of this, is it enables them to be productive while they're collecting unemployment. And I think that is, that's so, great. Well, so this is, the self-employment assistance program is, it's doing self-employment assistance activities full time. In in lieu of the job search, so activities right. towards starting a business in lieu of doing the, is it three searches per week that is required to get benefits now? So rather than prepping resumes and so forth, the right. individual is developing a business plan and mm -hmm. working on so figuring out funding and marketing and so forth. So if someone loses a job and goes to unemployment, this would be given to them as an option, or right. the information yeah. would be given to them. Right. And then there are qualifications <coughs> they have to meet to get into the program. Yeah. But in the past, it hasn't been given? Correct. Did you know that it was available? Well, as Damien mentioned, the program sunset, uh, I believe it was in 2017. So we haven't had the authority to administer the program. Uh, I think there was a very short four or five year period of time in which it wasn't active during uh, the beginning or towards the end of the last recession up through, I think, 2017. Mm -hmm. And we had. Uh, a handful of individuals inquire about it, and then I think ultimately we only had one individual who actually participated in the program. Uh, and so I think the department's position is we're more than happy to bring it back. We think it could be beneficial for some individuals. And we well, it could be beneficial to Vermont. What if they sure. build the next Ben and Jerry? So sure. they, you know, whatever they build might benefit us enormously. And so for us, I think it's just we're more than happy to bring it back and do a better job of notifying individuals of its availability. Yeah, I think it's great. We're a state of entrepreneurs. Encourage I, them. I will say just real quick, because I'm, because I'm speaking, uh, we received a letter from USDOL um, two days ago with some concerns about this. Um, there are two provisions of federal law they just want to make sure um, are not in conflict. So I'm happy to chat with you about them, but um, in my initial review, I don't think there's a problem with how it's currently worded. Um, but the, the two issues are there's the bill allows for up to 35 participants at any given time on the program. US DOL uh, federal law says you can only have, or you cannot have 
uh, more than 5% of your total unemployed population on the program. I don't think 35 will ever get to 5%, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's a simple, you know, Damien, it could be just an addition of, you know, at no point can we have more than 5% uh, eligible for the program. Um, and then there is another concern they raised with a section that states that um, the cost of administering the program cannot be in excess of the cost that would be incurred by the state and charged to the UI Trust Fund had the individuals not participated. That's a provision I'm, I'm not entirely sure how they implement it, so I need to reach out to get to them for clarification. I don't see it being a problem. I'm just letting you know. Uh, I mean, from a drafting standpoint, it sounds like those are two easy fixes. Yeah, yes. If the conference committee wants to have that language added, mm -hmm. Let's cover um, our I could work with Cameron and get that done uh, today. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good idea. But I think it's a great idea. program. And it sounds like the language there is essentially ready to go from the OL, so <coughs> that can probably be pretty quick. Um, the next section, 24 of the Senate and 25 of the House, is a report. Uh, again, the date will need to be moved out by a year. Same with the Self-Employment Assistance Program report. Uh, from the Commissioner of Labor, um, to the two committees of jurisdiction regarding potential approaches to mitigate the impact of a single separation from employment on a small employer's uh, unemployment insurance experience rating and contribution rate. Uh, if you remember last year, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the issue where you have an employer who previously has had a pristine record, but they only have five employees and they lay off one. Uh, now the ratio of the benefits paid out um, for that employee to their actual payroll uh, goes right off and they can skyrocket up to a very high uh, tax rate within the UI program. Um, whereas if they were a larger employer and they only laid off one person, even if they had a history of doing it, that one person being laid off uh, is a very small impact on them. So some states have done certain things to try to mitigate that impact, and this is just basically looking at a report. Uh, it, if you remember, there was a proposal that was taken out of the bill that would have eliminated uh, the charge against experience rating for an employer that had only paid $1,000 or less to an employee during their um, base period. The problem there is that that would have exempted some employers who had employed the individual for, say, five years, but then laid them off a couple of days in the base period. And so it wasn't that the individual was a new or probationary employee. It was just that the luck of the calendar as far as the employer was concerned. Uh, and so that was the concern about that provision, and this was put in in its place to look to see if we can do a more focused um, response to that. Uh, and that brings us to the last section, which is in the Senate version only. And this would be a report by the Office of Legislative Counsel. Again, the date needs to be moved out. Uh, regarding the history of the exemptions from the provisions of the unemployment insurance law for newspaper carriers and individuals who have formed a single member LLC. Um, including uh, proposed rule changes related to newspaper carriers and the Vermont Supreme Court's decision in the In Re Borbo Custom Homes case back in 2017. Um, and then identifying any potential legislative changes that the General Assembly may wish to consider. Um, so for those of you who have been here for a while, uh, you're likely familiar with the newspaper carriers issue. Uh, question of whether they should be exempt or covered under uh, the unemployment insurance law has been at issue in this building for I think something like 15 years now. Oh, quite a while, um, as long as Mike and I have been here. And Mike on the edges. Before that, the second year, about six bills that we put in to exempt them, and they've not been passed. Yeah, I looked back. Uh, 
used as justification. <laughs> yeah, La last night I was looking back at uh, just some basic history on this for the last 20 years. And we'll go back to the, through three of my predecessors. Yeah. Um, so, um, so that, that takes you back there. The Borbeau Custom Homes case was a case in 2017 that basically ruled that uh, an individual who's formed a single member LLC because the UI law refers to an individual in its ABC <coughs> test for independent contractors. If you formed a single member LLC, you're not covered. Uh, and you, you can be, you're deemed an independent contractor, essentially. Um, so there were some questions about that. I wrote a brief memo a couple years ago that would be incorporated into right. here. Uh, and then with a look at statutes from other states. Um, I would point out that I cannot take a position on this, so I'm going to be sharing past reports and basically saying here's what's been introduced and what the options are, but if I can't take a position. It's, both of these are very controversial issues. Um, so all I can do is give you the information. Um, Oh, and the second piece of this report was a request that uh, the Commissioner of Labor, in consultation with the Secretary of State, <coughs> submit a report on the number of individuals who, following the Borbo Custom Homes case, formed a single member LLC and are performing services that are now excluded from the definition of employment for purposes of UI after that, based on that case ruling. Um, the only thing I would highlight here is it may be difficult to determine whether someone is actually performing services that are now excluded. Um, you may be able to get the number of LLCs that were formed and whether that is an increase over history, but it, it's likely going to be difficult to determine how many of those are actually performing services where before they would have been an employee and they would be an employee but for the LLC. Mm -hmm. and that would be a big piece of investigation. I, I'm not even sure that um, that's information that you could could effectively get. Um, just well, given other than calling them all and co-visiting them and checking them out. Right. Well, and still then they might. Yeah. You know, Can you um, do the first part? The first part I could do. And I mean, it, could the Secretary of State help you with that? Um, well, so uh, I could certainly, um, I mean, what I would say is if you want the information from the Secretary of State, um, you may just ask them to provide the number of LLCs and you may want to look at um, the number of LLCs that were formed since that case and then in the five years before so you can kind of get a track. Um, but I, I don't know whether the Secretary of State will have anything beyond the numbers of the LLCs, but that may give you some inkling. Uh, again, though, it'll be hard to say because so, are there other changes in law that have encouraged people to form an LLC? Well, I know it's not going to be exact, but if you had the number of single member LLCs formed since the decision, and then you compare those, you know, who the who the person is, which you would find out in the single member, and to, if there's a way to check whether they were right prior to forming that or an employee of uh, someone's of a business that was paying wages, you could cross-check that, then you would see that somebody who had been an employee covered by an employment thing made the step of being in, becoming an LLC. It wouldn't be determined so, uh, to give you a feel. The challenge here is that uh, we're, we're looking at the UI statutes and under federal law with the UI statutes, we're only allowed to use that information for certain things and we're not allowed to go into specifics for individuals uh, if it's gonna go into a public forum. So this is, this is a challenge. This actually relates to one of the other challenges we talked about last year, which is the department publicizing more of its penalties. The UI restrictions are particularly difficult on this. So I, I think 
under federal law as I read it, I'm not sure we can get that information at an individual level to then marry up to the LLCs. I think you can get information on the raw numbers of LLCs, but marrying it up. Can the department get that information and not release any names? Just saying we found 25 people who fell into this category. Uh, I I would have to defer to the department on that, um, but I I would be concerned about whether they could even do that under state and federal confidentiality laws here. Um, and the UI the state laws largely mirror the federal confidentiality requirements, um, where they can share individualized data for purposes of things like food stamps, um, but for purposes. <laughs> For purposes of um, research, I think the data has to be share, shared in an anonymized block. That's but that's suggest. what we're asking. That's right. But I, what I think I'm saying is that when you have an anonymized block, block, it's hard to tell which members of that anonymized block from 2016 or 2017 formed an LLC in 2018. That data is... You'd have to track that in. You, you'd have to de-anonymize yeah. it uh, in order to do that because you, you're linking the LLC to an individual, but you don't know. So you're saying that even, even though they're keeping that confidential, the names of the people, they're just trying to find out for themselves, let's say, how many people are taking advantage of this new law. They can't even try and find out how many people are taking advantage of the new law to keep it for themselves. I, I, I'm, I have concerns. I mean, I'll defer to the department who deals with this more, but based on what I've developed from my reading of the federal law, I think that you're, you're skating into an area where you're probably crossing that line. Okay. Well, I, so, I'd be, I'd be willing that, to put some language in here to the extent not inconsistent with federal law. We should do this. Yeah, that would be interesting. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a serious policy question, yeah. and we need to get some facts. Mm -hmm. I think it's we're talking about an issue of misclassification, and there are people who are clearly employees, and just by changing their legal, I mean, the Supreme Court said in their decision that, you know, this is an anomaly that we're in this situation. From 50 years ago, we wrote a law that talked about individuals, and so we have to decide this way, but it goes against the concept of whether a person's an independent contractor Classified. So all we're trying to do is get some information as to how prevalent it is that people took advantage of this legal loophole. So I could certainly draft something that says uh, get the information um, and you'd likely want to change this so it, it's not just since Borbo, but in the five years before and then since you can actually see a trend on LLC registrations and then to the extent possible and consistent with federal and state law, mm -hmm. um, the department can try to determine. Um, but I, my, my one concern is that for that portion of the report, um, you'll end up getting a paragraph back that uh, explains why they weren't able to do it for purposes of the law. I, I can't testify for the department though. This is just my, my understanding of the law is that their restrictions here are pretty extensive. I'm really interested um, in understanding the scope of the problem. And so I think getting data on how many single member LLCs have been formed in the last however many years makes a lot of sense. And seeing if there was a huge spike. There might be tax reasons that there was a huge spike separate from this issue. And so once we had that data, I think right. we might have to drill down. But I think understanding why someone might start a single member LLC is going to be even interviewing each person individually, which I don't think is possible, but even if we did that, the answers people might give on that issue could range wildly from what even their original motivations were and how they see those motivations today. So it strikes, strikes me as methodologically impossible to get that particular data, but I think stopping at the idea of asking about how many following the decision that formed a single member LLC and going back in time is a great start or even a midpoint of this conversation. So I wonder if we could sort of get that. meet in the middle there yeah. with that understanding that piece of data and then going from there. Yeah. So I can I can redraft that portion 
um, to address that issue. With the, the first half of this, um, you can certainly leave that in there. My only note would be that this is also something I can do through uh, an individual um, research request. Um, if you put it in statute, I'll prepare a nice formal report for you with a cover sheet and all of that. Um, so we could do this now. You could do yes. you could do subsection A uh, just by literally sending me an email, um, and then I okay. put in so a research request and we talk about when you need the data. Um, yeah, this whole conversation kind of highlights the fact that, um, in my opinion, that a lot of this stuff needs testimony. Also, you know, it would be helpful to have more testimony on the outside. And with Damian doing this, you know, writing a letter, <coughs> excuse me, for the committee, um, you know, I don't, you know, I'm having a hard time figuring out um, why we actually need this to be in the conference. But, um, well, let's, uh, let's put it on hold for now. Um, See if we can figure out a solution here. Uh, I appreciate the comments you made. I just um, I'm not sure we can't do a little better in terms of at least uh, figuring whether the people that we identify as signing up for an LLC within some period of time right before that were considered wage earners under the unemployment law before they became that would be another factor just to say that they've taken advantage of the um, of the decision because we you know when this decision came down when this decision came down there was a lot of talk in the business community say well now we don't have to worry about misclassification mm -hmm. anymore we'll just tell our employees sign up for an LLC and we don't have to pay them and this this is people that they wouldn't even have considered as mm -hmm. independent contractors because uh, it was clear they're working full time for them and we're in the control so it's an oddball, uh, it's a kind of a weird decision. I think most people would agree by reading it's really based on a technicality of the way the statute was worded. Well, even the department was in the courts mm -hmm. arguing against the decision. So, um, so let's uh, let's uh, let us talk among ourselves and maybe with you guys, and we'll figure out what to do with this section. The only other section I see in here is. Uh, difference of the year. Uh, um, right. And the uh, effective dates here. And the effective dates. So the, the Senate has a July 1, 2024 sunset for the AG enforcement provisions. The House has July 1, 2025. Um, well, and in keeping with the pattern, I guess the real uh, choice here is between not those two dates, but two days a year later. Like right, so it'll be right. July 1, 2025 and July 1, 2026 would be the, the two sunset options based on your current positions. So why don't we, we do, is there any reason why we can't do, just split the difference and do? January? January. January. Let's just do earlier rather than later. Well, I think you want to be careful okay. because you're eliminating those uh, task force. You're eliminating the AG, and if this, if we find that this is something that's working after we get the reports, and if we put it in January, we're actually going to have to <coughs> deal with it a year before. before. Okay. Good so point. I'm thinking that. So what's what are the what are these two dates? So it's uh. Do, 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 uh Discontinuing the task force and discontinuing. Yeah, so basically the um, the Senate position right now is a five year sunset and the House is a six year sunset on it um, for the, the AG enforcement piece. So the rest of it um, that it's really only those the first um, ten sections or so. I prefer the House position. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I think, um, so, uh, with us uh, talking uh, to Damon before. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk among ourselves sure. and talk to you guys and 
on that last well, I, can, I, can, I can tell you now that our response is going to be to essentially just clean up, you know, take out the sections that are no, you know, no right. longer needed mm -hmm. um, because they've already right. either passed the rules or the votes have been gone and move the dates, you know, right. update the dates. That was going to be our response. So we'll start there and then you work on your. Right. And I'll, I'll add the language that Cameron highlighted right. for yeah. the oh, yeah. yeah. assistance. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. And then really that is just the only question is the former section 25 in the Senate bill. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And then you were saying you could do all issue. of that without uh, with the exception of the, I can I can get all of this done. I've I've already updated the dates. In, uh, He's done. Oh, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I mean, in section but, 25, you could do all of A and half of. B. No, I can do A. You can do um, I I think it. I would uh, say that it probably makes sense either for the LLC data, ask for it directly mm -hmm. from. Uh, the Secretary, Secretary of State, State, or if you're looking for some sort of review, ask for it through the DOL, um, because I don't have access mm -hmm. to that data. Um, and so if, you, if they're going to look for any gaps in their confidentiality rule where they might be able to share anonymized information, um, I don't have any access to that um, confidential information, so you don't want to do that through me because the response will be it's, confidential it's illegal for us to share that information with you. Right, um, but you're saying A you can do without statute. That's what I want to say. A I could do, okay. yeah. Okay. You don't need to put that in the bill for me to be able to do it. If you put it in the bill, the only difference if you put it in the bill is I'll prepare a formal report rather than an informal memo. Well, there are some other reasons to highlight it publicly. Right. And I, so, I, I, I mean, mean I, I'd say there are other reasons to highlight something, those concerns publicly. I think that we want to make sure that going forward, we are we're not encouraging any further opportunities for misclassification. Isn't that our objective? So, the right. more we highlight areas that are full of concern, uh, you know, that doesn't bother us. So, so, just to move it along, um, I would ask the department if you could get, get us. Uh, any uh, and Damien, any statute that would prohibit you from we got a list of 500 LLCs that were just formed in this period of time with the names of those people and you can't look at those names and say of those names 40 of them were wage earners are covered by UI before they without any names whatsoever if you can show us that you can't do it, then we don't even really need to put in to the extent permissible by law. But if you can do that, I don't, it would help us know the extent that people are sort of playing that decision. And, Thank you. And then do either of you have to ask Secretary of State for that information? Because I think it would be in for, in good to have. Well, we'll figure out how to do it. Yeah. I just want to know if it's legal first. Yeah, oh well, there's that. I think we are in agreement that we should get that in the first part of information. The first part. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good morning, committee. We're on the record. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mike. Thank you. So before we get started, I just want to apologize to the committee and to everybody on the sidelines. Expected us to start taking this up at 9 o'clock. Um, we had a conference committee meeting on S108, the holdover from last year. I didn't anticipate that we were going to do a full-blown walkthrough of, of the bill again. Um, I didn't realize the Senate hadn't done that. The, the House had done that already. And um, it was an expectation that we were here to sign off on it. So. Um, we weren't anticipating to, to go on an extra um, 35 minutes on that, so my apologies. Um, so we're here to begin looking at H641. Um, so David has just prepared a little summary for us, and then we'll uh, continue on with testimony from there. So David, if you sure. get us rolling. <coughs> so good morning, uh, David Hall, Legislative Council. So the bill that we're discussing um, as introduced is H641, um, and that uh, 
is an act relating to promoting, uh, I think, what, I forget the technology, economic development um, ish. ish. The point is, here's what's, here's what's relevant. Since that bill was introduced, um, as with a lot of bills this year, given the deadlines that were advanced, um, some work continued to happen after the introduction. So um, what we would be working from this morning is actually a draft strike all amendment to that bill, um, which is posted. And um, in the biggest possible picture, the bill proposes a couple of things. One is uh, a change in the veggie program that would allow incentives to be uh, basically awarded in the form of a loan. And then some details go along with that. And then the other part is some changes uh, from this Think Vermont Innovation Initiative within the Agency of Commerce. So um, rather than going through word by word and point by point what all the nuance is, because there's a lot, I thought it, my role here to be helpful to you would be to orient you on what we have now, how things sort of work, where they exist, where they live, and then I will allow the proponents of these proposals to uh, offer to you what their recommendations would be. So if that's acceptable to you, that's how I would propose proceeding. Okay. All right. So a uh, couple of things. I prepared this summary uh, regarding a lot of the acronym-based programs that might be involved in H641, specifically Veggie, Vepsi, Vita, and what those mean, how they work. So I know a lot of you, to some of you, this is maybe refresher, some of you may be new, but um, the first thing here, the Vermont Employment Growth Incentive Program, which would be the basis of the first part of the bill, um, Veggie and Vepsi. So while Veggie is the program, remember that mm -hmm. VEPSI is the council that oversees that program and oversees TIFFs, right? So VEPSI, it's an 11-member board. Nine of those members are appointed by the governor based on certain criteria. There's one House member. There's one Senate member. Um, VEPSI oversees Veggie and TIFFs, right? And also, VEPSI maintains the cost-benefit model, which was developed many years ago, has been tweaked from time to time, but it's kind of like that black box where we put all the inputs and it spits out all the outputs and helps us figure out the value of things like incentives and TIF investments. Um, it's a very important aspect of the program. So um, that's VEPSI. And I just wanted to talk about the veggie program, how incentives work. I've tried to distill this down to like six steps, and it's pretty complicated. Um, there are a lot of people who know a lot more about it. There's a lot more detail, but I want to just go through the basics. So a veggie incentive, remember, is a direct cash payment to a business that meets certain performance requirements, right? It's not. Mm, it's not really a grant. It's not really a tax credit. Uh, it's an incentive, and it's a cash incentive. Um, and you have to check all the boxes to get paid. Okay. What are the boxes? Well, they are new qualifying jobs, new payroll, and or new capital investment. All right, so basically the business comes to VEBSI, specifies the performance requirements that it aims to achieve each year for up to five award years. So in a nutshell, I come in to you, your VEBSI, I say in award year 2012, I'm going to create X number of new qualifying jobs, I'm going to add this much payroll, and I don't have to, but I can also say, and I'm going to do $10 million in capital investment. Okay, those are my targets, those are my performance requirements. So VEPSI approves an application, not the incentive, but the application to get into the program if it meets certain criteria. And chief among those, uh, the major 
pieces of the program are that the benefits to the state outweigh the costs to the state, okay? So using that cost-benefit model, knowing everything we know from the application, VEPC has to find that this is gonna be a net fiscal benefit to the state, right? Otherwise, you're, you don't participate. The other part is this but-for test, which we all know and love, which says that absent but-for this investment, the growth either would not happen at all or it would happen in a significantly different and less desirable manner, right? So you gotta check those boxes just to get in the door. All right, now we don't have to dwell on the details of calculating the value of an incentive, but I've tried to simplify this in formula because it's a little bit complicated. It's not just like, okay, you create five jobs and we'll give you $10,000. That's not how it works, right? You have to come in and first first bullet, figure out what that net new growth revenue to the state is. What's our benefit? Let's say it's $10 million. Well, you don't just get $10 million, right? The whole deal here is that the state and the business are gonna share the proceeds of this growth, right? So, uh, before you even you know get anywhere, you once you've figured out, A, your net new revenue, you take 20% off the top. And the most the business would ever get would be 80% of that Unless it's an enhanced incentive, let's not worry about that. <laughs> so after you've got B, the potential share of uh, the net new revenue, you have to do a couple of other calculations. You have to figure out what they call the incentive percentage, which is all of your payroll performance requirements. Uh, I mean, so your net new revenue divided by your PPRs. You have to calculate qualifying payroll. This is a very important thing. This is payroll performance, but minus background growth, right? The whole theory, maybe you remember this, we've talked about it, is that we don't want to give awards because you're just growing at the rate your business would grow anyway, right? That's background growth. Now, there's some controversy about whether it should be business specific or industry specific, but the bottom line is we're trying to factor out and just incentivize new stuff over the background, okay? So once we figure out that, we calculate the value of the incentive by multiplying D by C, spits out a number, and then here's another really important point. We essentially divide by five. There's some adjustments for when the first year award happens in the uh, application year, but essentially, you don't just get it all at once, right? And you don't get it up front. You get it after you've hit your targets, and then you get it in installments. And that's an important thing because that's over five years, right? Okay, so you earn your incentive if, first of all, you maintain the base level. You don't get to dip back down. You have to at least maintain. And then you have to meet or exceed your payroll performance requirement. That is an absolute trigger, right? You have to add the amount of payroll that you said that you would. And then you also either need to hit the jobs or the capital investment. It could be both, you could pitch both, you don't have to, but it's payroll plus one of those things. And that's for each award year. All right. Well, so how do you get paid? That's all the front end. The back end actually is at the Department of Taxes. Okay, so this is a two part dance first council all the way to the point of April 30th and we go to tax. We submit an a, a claim to them annually. And you have to do it annually whether you made it or not. You have to tell them how things went. Hmm. Um, and if tax finds that you've hit all the targets, then you get paid. Incentive payments are made directly in cash. Business gets a payment worth 20% of the total incentive each year for five years provided it earns the incentive and maintains growth. And then remember that the total possible time frame here because of that tail is actually nine years possible. So if I came to you again, I said, word year one, this, two, this, word year three years, four, and five. And I hit my targets in five and I maintain, I'm gonna get paid for the four years after a word year five. So we could be in this relationship for a long time, right? 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on recapture, reduction, and repayment because it's pretty technical about what happens and what happens if something bad happens. But just know that if you fail to achieve or if you fall back down, you don't do what you were supposed to do, um, and you've been paid, they can come and try to recapture your award. Or they can reduce the amount of your award if you didn't make as much capital investment as you said you would. Um, and you could be required to pay the state back. That's at least possible. They have the authority. Um, there is an annual reporting requirement. There is a confidentiality piece about proprietary business information. We don't need to get into that. Uh, there are a couple of enhanced incentives. You have worked on this. You may remember if you're in a qualifying labor market area, you can get a little more benefit. And then there's also green veggie. If you're in that sector, you can get a little more benefit. Lastly, and this is important, is the annual program cap. So you may be curious, why is there a cap if we are just incentivizing growth that never would have happened anyway? There's no actual cost to the state, so why do we even limit? Well, I, I think from the very beginning there has been just because people are worried about authorizing payments that exceed a certain amount. So right now in statute, there are, for each calendar year, we have this bifurcated system. The max in a calendar year that Pepsi can approve is $15 million initially, and then it's only $10 million for final approval. So if application kind of happens in phases, and you come in the door and you get the initial approval, they can do up to $15 million. But the final sign-off, though, is limited to 10 calendar year, first come, first serve. And if it looks like you're going to go over that cap, then the council has to go to the governor and say, it looks like we could go over the cap this year. We've had a lot of growth. We would like to bump up that final approval cap from 10 up to as much as $15 million. That approval is by the Joint Fiscal Committee, not by the governor. And the Joint Fiscal Committee, it's very, um, and the Joint Fiscal Committee can request and receive whatever documents, information, materials it needs to find that Increasing the cap would be a net benefit to the state. Okay? So that's veggie and even shorter <coughs> Vita. Before I go further to Vita, any veggie questions, any Vepsi questions in there? <laughs> um, yeah. How long has this program been in, in uh, existence? I don't actually know. Mm -hmm. um, because before it was VEPSI, it was EATI, and that was even longer ago. So I don't know the total. 15, 20 years? So do you know if anybody has succeeded? In oh, yes, process? definitely. Yeah. Yep. And, and VEPSI does a great annual report, has tons of information. Um, you don't get uh, business specific stuff, you get aggregated data, but it, it, it tells you. Basically, how many applications, how many new jobs, what the total outcome was, new growth, new revenue, new investment. So, um, yes. If, if success is have people gone through the program, hit the targets, and received payments, then yes, it has been successful. It's a rebate. <laughs> After you hit the targets. Is it a cash-based performance incentive? <laughs> it's not a tax credit, because that's what the original one was. It's not a tax credit. Yeah. It had a tail too, but it's right. a rebate. You meet the requirements, you get money back. Well, so I'm hesitant to accept the term rebate because uh, rebate means you paid something and then you got part of it back. And um, <coughs> the only basis for payment here is that you hit business targets that you have specified in an application. So it's completely independent of your other relationships to the state, to taxes, to anything else. It's, it's solely dependent on what was in your application for targets and did you meet the targets. Okay, my understanding, David, is that the, um, you have to prove you paid the payroll taxes. Those are to the state. So those are, I don't know if it's income or unemployment or whatever your, your state payroll tax usually is you are. You know. This is my understanding. Sure. Okay, I could be wrong. Yeah. 
but my understanding is that it was payroll taxes that you actually proved you paid because you really hired these people with whatever that's the criteria you know your PPRs mm -hmm. and then once you hit those markers then they would rebate back to you whatever percentage you need. sure fair enough yes the, the new payroll is the single criteria. most uh, you know uh, deciding criteria there are others but Yes, tax department has that information. Mm -hmm. Did you add these people to your payroll? Did you meet that target? Did you go from 1.2 million to 1.6 million employee payroll? And I think some of the, tip, the difficulty of tracking that is one of the reasons why we're here talking about a new proposal. And yeah. we'll, we'll hear from tax about that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Okay. So, uh, Emma? Sorry, I have yeah, one go, question. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, the calculation process, mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of the origins of that? Uh, the substance of it? How 20% was chosen. Sure, fair stuff. enough. Yeah. Well, uh, look, here's my understanding. There was an EATI. People got really upset that people were getting incentives without proving growth. Um, <coughs> Tom Kivett and Sue Messner and a few other people sat around in a room and came up with a formula and a model for a cost benefit and spat out what used to be in statute. <coughs> a few years ago, we rewrote this chapter to go through methodically step by step, and here we are today. Thanks. Yeah. So on the, the issue with the original EATI was the clawback issue. Mm -hmm trying to get the money back after it's been paid and they didn't perform. Yes. That was a big issue. That was a tax credit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to switch over to Vita. It's shorter, there's less, because Vita does a lot more and there's more people here that are more knowledgeable what, uh, about what they do. But the reason that I wanted to just speak briefly and orient you in that universe is because Vita is a different thing. Right? So where we have VEPSI, we have this council that oversees these problems that do TIFs and incentives based on cost benefit, etc. Vita is a lender, right? Vita was created by the state. It is a public instrumentality. Um, it has a CEO and officers and loan officers and lots of employees in a beautiful building and it operates in tandem with banks and then separately to make loans to businesses for different purposes. Right? Um, it is typically, I mean, I, I, you know, you, if you've spent the many years that I have listening to Joe and, and then others talk about Vita, they operate separately from the state. They don't get all their general funds. They're not an agency, they are an operation unto themselves. Now, they do have the backing of the state to the extent that it is authorized, at least by statute, to issue bonds. And, it, and there, those could be of different kinds. And there is some moral obligation of the state implicated by the amount of outstanding bonds and the amount of outstanding loans that VITA issues. Um, and that is still capped by statute, what the outstanding amounts can be. There have been movements in years past to eliminate those because of VITA's independence and to give it more flexibility in its self-autonomy and underwriting. So far, there still is that nexus to the state. However, VITA is VITA. VITA is not part of ACCD. VITA is not part of VEPSI. VEPSI is not part of VITA. So they are separate uh, things. And they have lots of different programs, and I'm sure you'll hear a whole lot more about it. But everything from commercial financing to energy loans, infrastructure, brownfields, uh, water, uh, wastewater improvements, agricultural loans. VITA uh, was authorized by statute to create a nonprofit for emerging technologies, since we have VSET, which operates in Burlington. Um, so that's a separate animal. Now, why is that relevant? Because in 8641, the proposal so far is essentially to thread into the veggie program um, an incentive that could be a loan from VITA which may be forgiven over a matter of time if you hit your targets, or if you don't, you have to pay them back. And so, at the biggest possible level, that's why these two institutions are being married in this bill. 
So that's all I'm going to say about those first parts. The second part is this uh, Think Vermont Innovation Initiative. And I'm bringing you to Act 197 of 2018 because there already is a Think Vermont Innovation Initiative. And I, frankly, haven't had time to chat with folks about uh, whether this new proposal is supposed to be part of that or replace it. I have drafted it so that the old is repealed and the new is something new. And that's something you're all going to work out <laughs> with the proponents of the measure. But I wanted to at least explain to you what there is now so you'll know uh, the difference between that and what is new. So you, brushing off the dust, it's been a couple of years now. You created in session law, so this is not a codified permanent program necessarily. I mean, it's law, but I, I don't know if it was intended to be permanent because it's in the white books, not the green books, and there was only a one-time appropriation to it. There was this innovation, uh, Think Vermont Innovation Initiative created to respond to growth needs of small businesses with 20 or fewer employees by funding innovative strategies that accelerate small business growth and meet project criteria specified here. It would enable the state to invest in projects with grants that can be accessed more quickly and with fewer restrictions than traditional federal initiatives. So, it's, this is short. The process commerce in consultation with VEPSI would adopt a schedule and process for getting uh, grant proposals on a competitive basis, distribute grants across geographic areas of the state, and distribute grants across diverse industry sectors and business types. Grants would only be for one fiscal year. And you can't get one for more than two fiscal years, one single recipient. So the funding, the matching requirements, the, the secretary had to require that a grant recipient provide a matching grant one-to-one. -one. And then the eligibility criteria are here. You have to provide workforce training recruitment that's otherwise not eligible for some sort of uh, state or federal program and that serves an immediate employer need to fill job vacancies. <clears throat> To establish or enhance a facility that attracts small companies, remote workers, etc. Remember, this is in the remote worker bill. Um, enable or support deployment of broadband. Leverage economic development funding outside state government, such as new market tax credits programs, small business innovation grants. Support growth in the aerospace, aviation, or aviation technology sectors. You may remember how this made its way in, or provide technical assistance to support small business growth. And they had to have outcomes and measures. The last thing I wanted to show you in the money piece there was here in two, $150,000 appropriated for this purpose. So that's what's essentially on the books since 2018. Um, flexible grant program requiring a one-to-one -one match for certain purposes. I think I can stop there, and if, unless you have questions now, get out of the way. Questions for David? Right over there. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you. Sure. Very helpful. Yeah. Maybe. morning. Thank you so much for having me in, Mr. Chair and committee. It was wonderful to see you all again this year. Um, so last year, did you want to okay. give me a quizzical look for my commissioner? Uh, so last year, the uh, we came in with some suggestions on some changes to the um, veggie program um, that uh, led to some really great discussion. Those changes came out of a report that, and study that had been done in 2017. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking about, um, <coughs> for those, the best ways to implement the outcomes that we were looking for. Um, <coughs> we went back to the drawing board in this um, uh, off 
season and um, spoke with um, some economists, did some research, um, and have tried to come back with something that maybe could achieve those outcomes that we were looking for, but in a different way that, that mitigates some of the risk that was of concern last year. Um, and so what I'd first like to talk about is um, the convertible loan program that we're proposing in partnership with VITA. Um, so we can go through the language or can just sort of talk about more of the impetus of, of this. Um, but <clears throat> I guess I'll, I'll start with how we got here. Um, so we've seen that about 72% of veggie applicants have um, under 100 employees um, at the time of application. Um, when we look at the completed, those that have finished in the program, um, those tend to be Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, Dealer.com, um, some of our uh, more robust businesses. Now, at the time of application, a lot of those were businesses were smaller and grew quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but we're looking at how do we help our smaller businesses um, be successful. And um, we did some research um, from the work of Timothy Bartik, who I know that the state auditor has talked about his work, and um, I was introduced to his work through the state auditor, and I appreciate that because I um, learned a great deal um, from reading that. And in his in his most recent book, he talks about you know how do we how can policy policymakers really make incentives work better? And the first thing he talks about is upfront payments. And I think this is especially true for our small businesses. Getting an incentive dollar up front um, has a much greater value than if it's paid out over nine years. Now, the nine <coughs> years payout has been put in place to really protect the state. Um, and so we're looking at this partnership with VITA as a way to continue to protect the state. So the, the idea is that a business with under 100 employees would still apply to, to BEPSI. There would still be um, mandatory criteria that have been put in place, um, but that they would also, if approved by BEPSI, be able to apply to VITA for a what we're calling a convertible loan. So the incentive value that's run through the model that um, David discussed before um, would be the maximum incentive that could be authorized. Um, and that would be done through VITA as a um, loan with three years without payment. At the end of those three years, if the targets that were set were made, and that would be verified by VITA and by the tax department, um, that loan would be converted into a grant. So those incentive dollars instead of being paid out from the tax department to the business, um, would be lent to the business from VITA, and tax department would, would pay VITA if the targets have been met, if those benefits have been realized from the state. Um, Megan, are you, are you using the same criteria to evaluate as you are now? Or, are you, or is there there's a thought a, of changing? There's some a of few other changes. So that's sort of the structure of how, how it works. Um, so some of the other changes we've looked at is, is nine years too much, too long um, for a small business to be able to project how their growth is going to be? And I think where we, a business terminates, and that's not to say they aren't successful, because they may meet their first year targets and second year targets and third year targets. They've created the benefit and they've received the incentive for those targets. But year four and year five, um, they may not be able to project out to. Doing nine years worth of a projection for a small business can be difficult. So one of the changes we're suggesting is making this a three year. Um, so the max, you're looking at three years of what your growth would be, and that's based on three years worth of benefit to the state. So it would be a smaller dollar value. Um, Just the, for this program. We're not, right. It's not a suggestion to change the Right, it's for, for this program we're looking at that three by three rather than five by five. Um, in addition, um, you know, the labor market in Vermont is tight. It's hard to find employees. Um, and so one of the conversations we had with Mr. Bartek was about, you know, what is, what is the value the state is looking for? And it's, it's new jobs or increased wages. Um, so we've for this program, we've taken out headcount 
and really focused on payroll increase. And if that payroll increase is found through new jobs, that's a benefit to the state. If that payroll increase is found through um, wage increases to existing employees, and the tax department can talk about how um, they can base that on average wage, so it's not just our CEOs are getting huge bonuses, but on the average wage, um, then that's also a benefit to the state. And that investments in capital investments, um, so you know, if you're looking at meeting market growth demands, um, and you know that you're not going to be able to find 100 production employees in Vermont. Um, you may post 100 production employment jobs in the newspaper and everywhere else you can, um, but you're going to fill 10 of those. Um, if you can invest in machinery and equipment that creates the productivity um, that you need and instead are able to create 10 higher wage, higher um, skill level, technician jobs or um, upgrade the skills of your current employees um, then that will remain that will allow that business to remain in Vermont and not have to look elsewhere where there is a much larger um, unemployment rate and, and workforce availability um, so this program would focus on the capital investment and, the, and have a payroll growth um, mandate of minimum now again the incentive is based on the target so there would be a minimum of what they would have to um, target, but they could go above that um, to get the incentive they're looking for. If a company meets their payroll target, um, then they're eligible to have the loan converted, and the conversion of the loan would be to the percentage of the capital investment they made. So if they said we're going to make a million dollars of capital investment and they made $750,000, of that, 75% of the loan would be converted and 25% would um, be a traditional loan that Vita has underwritten um, and would have the um, terms already arranged of how that repayment would, would come. Um, and the benefit to that is also that the business is now knows what their repayment schedule is and it's not a, okay, 30 days you, you have to pay us $250,000. It's a more reasonable Never repayment, <laughs> right? And you know, I think small business or, or, or small or medium-sized businesses are also more likely to be taking on debt for capital investments. Um, it's not something they're going to capitalize on their own, um, so they're willing to carry that debt. Um, we do have some some businesses who would like to testify <coughs> about this program and the benefit that it could do, so hopefully we can arrange, arrange that sometime. Um, one of them is uh, Hermit Tush Brewery in um, Brattleboro. Breweries are capital intensive businesses. They would not apply for the current veggie program because of the nine year payout. And they, they can't make this project go but for that because they need capital up front program like this would be um, an exciting opportunity for them to move forward with an expansion that they've been thinking about for years. So they'd like to come and talk about that. <coughs> um, clarification question and then another sure. little question. Uh, so uh, <coughs> let me know if I heard you correctly. If, uh, if, if the loan recipient fulfills all the qualifications within the three years, their loan is converted into a grant for 75% or 75% is converted into a grant and 25 sees a loan? Sorry, so that's, um, the conversion is based on the capital investment, the percentage. So if they met their capital investment goals, they met their payroll goals, the entire um, loan would be converted into a grant. Ah, okay. If they only met a certain percentage of their capital investment, it would be that percentage that was converted. But the, the payroll qualification, the payroll um, target would have to be met. Okay. And that's, you know, we're looking at, that's the really the benefit to the state is, is either new jobs or um, increased wages. And the second question I had was, um, so we went from, <clears throat> I understand that going from nine years is difficult for small businesses right. in terms of planning. Uh, <coughs> um, and so how did we come up with three years? We're looking at, you know, where, where do we see the fall off happening? Where's, in the current program, um, it's, it's not in 
immediate drop off. And we do see that, that folks have success in a few years of targets. Um, but you have to meet and maintain for four years. So you meet it year one, you maintain it for four years. In year two, you meet it year two, you maintain it for four years. By um, drop off, you mean people so that that's you've where given funds to, and then they kind of fail. Um, well, they haven't. We haven't given them funds yet. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. So it's Reason. where they've where they're um, saying in year four. Three years ago, we projected this. Things have changed, you know, and we're not going to meet that target. Um, or we expect it to be this larger capital investment, um, and we're going to do a portion of it, but we're not going to do all of it. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think we use the word terminated. Um, that should not be correlated with not being successful, um, because right. if we're looking at, you know, one year of an award, two year, the second year of an award, and it really is broken out that way, um, that there is success in a few years. Um, but. I think in order, you know, if we're looking at how do we make an upfront payment work best for a small business and protect the state, limiting it to a term that we've seen more of the success happen in. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I just got a quick question. So sure. that three-year um, moratorium, uh, is that where the business is sort of plateau? Uh, and that's why you, you've limited it to uh, three years? Three years, right. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's where we're seeing that that's mm -hmm. where they're able to meet what they Their were goals. projecting. Right. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, they they have this, what they're projecting, and then they find incredible success and blow it out of the water. But, um, you know, I think with a small business, we have to look at what's a reasonable business cycle. Can you give us some this examples of the, the successes? Of success of that have completed? Yeah. Um, Businesses. What yes. they're producing. Well, so um, I can give aggregate data about numbers of jobs created, mm -hmm. um, but not business specific of jobs created. Um, of our um, completed projects, um, Mylan Technologies, in St. Albans has completed, um, Revision Ballistics has completed, and completed would mean that they have met all of their targets for each year that they set targets. Um, Dealer.com, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, Commonwealth Yogurt, Albany College of Pharmacy, Vermont College of Fine Arts, and Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, um, the second award, have all completed. Now, because this is a nine-year program that started in 2007, we'll expect more completions um, to come through. There are um, 53 in total active and complete businesses. So there are businesses who are in the active cycle of um, the program that um, I think we're expecting a few to complete this year. Um, I have a few questions. Sure. Thanks. Um, one, the um, great overview that you just gave us when you started. Do you have that written down somewhere that we can have? We, we do have a white paper. Okay, of great. The, okay. Do we have that already? And I just... No, no. Mm -hmm. That would be just awesome. Just as fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, um, In one of your reports, or perhaps in the white paper, is there data on sort of the number of businesses that drop off at each number of years? We can get you that. Okay, that would be yeah. great too. Thank you. Um, and then, I assume we're going to get into more details about the targets around wage increases. Yes, and right. Another, so let me go deeper on this. Sure. Or do you want to talk? Whatever you'd like. I'll wait on that. Okay. Because we're going to spend like weeks and weeks on this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> weeks and weeks. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a feeling. Um, I think the number of the people in the room and how long you spend on something hmm. have a direct report. <laughs> I'm curious about the cost of administ that twenty the twenty eighty split that David went through at the beginning, yes. and I'm curious about the cost of administering these programs um, and how much of that twenty percent this takes up. So thinking about the time of the tax department, your time, council's time, all of that. How much the cost of administering those programs lines up with the amount that we are sort of, as a state, sure. recouping? Um, 
I can see if I have that figure in our annual report of what <coughs> the total, if we don't have it in the report, I think we can, we can pull what the, that 20% benefit would be for everyone that's been. Thank you. Um, but we do, I think the tax department has one full-time employee who works on this. Mm -hmm. um, and Betsy has myself, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, who work on this. And then the council's not stipended or anything? Uh, the council, um, eight of our members um, receive a $50 a day stipend. And the day is when they're at the meeting, not for the work that's done in advance. I, I'm not sure how the house treats The legislators get nothing. <laughs> not even expenses. So you don't get expenses? No. I give you a thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's only two of us. And, um, it's only two of us. And then my last question is about um, the size of the businesses. Sure. When I, you know, we talk about small businesses, and I know that small businesses and sort of a national economics framework is very different from how we actually think about small mm -hmm. businesses in Vermont mm -hmm. casually. And 100, less than 100 employees still seems very, very large to me by Vermont standards. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about this before. And so I'm curious about um, <coughs> if you have a sense of the focus here is really like the 75 to 100 employees, or if we're really going to be getting at the businesses that have like less than 30. Um, I think that if you like have projections about what that would, the kinds of businesses that would be able to access this. I mean, we have, we have the data on who's applied um, okay. to Veggie or mm -hmm. who's who's active, you know, what the size of the businesses yeah. are. Um, I think a lot of the concern last year was around the mitigation of risk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure it came up as much in this committee as it did in some of our Senate conversations about the risk to the state um, and and so the importance of having VITA as a partner to, to underwrite and having a security interest. Mm -hmm. um, If we're talking about micro businesses, and the risk is higher. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think when we're looking at what size is a business that's going to scale, mm -hmm. um, and the cost benefit model really, you know, looks at scalability um, of the business. Um, that whether it's 20 employees or 60 employees, mm -hmm. scaling is still where this will be. And I think. I would say anecdotally at this point, though we can certainly do more research on um, when a business has the capital in hand to be able to do um, the capital investments rather than you know, needing to take on debt to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. an incentive like this being more attractive to um, work as an incentive for those dollars to really make a difference um, and to be willing to take on debt. There may be businesses who who could participate in this, but who say, I don't want to carry the debt on my books. I'd rather mm -hmm. um, look at the other, look at veggie. Mm -hmm. um, and we are um, looking at this as a pilot program mm -hmm. that would be an alternative to veggie. Um, so you, you couldn't do both. Um, you would have to sort of pick a lane. And, mm -hmm. and the other part to that is um, because we're trying to mitigate the risk, if Vita says, you know, this this company is not someone that we'd co be comfortable underwriting, then they could they could apply for the traditional veggie. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess, I was, I'm sorry to interrupt, nope, but no I, was, um, I was thinking more about a business like Hermit Thrush, that I'm not sure if they were being discouraged, if they were offered veggie um, and sort of discouraged from even applying at the RDC <laughs> level, or, and would have, or, and if there's maybe a lot of small businesses that have sort of been discouraged from veggie because it doesn't make sense given how small they are and what the risk would be. And so they'd be sort of, we have a large um, supply of sort of smaller businesses who would be interested in this and weren't interested in veggie. Or I'm just trying to understand what the landscape yeah. actually looks like for who's going to be accessing this. I in think, terms of size um, of you know, Hormethesh will be able to speak for themselves, but they have yeah. not been discouraged. Um, certainly, I think. The RDC is excited about the possibility of this project and has been for years because it's a project that's been talked about but hasn't mm -hmm. been able to commence. 
Um, so the business has been the one saying, you know, we don't, we need the capital up front. Um, and that's why they're looking at, um, at this as a alternative that could be really beneficial to them rather than that. Um, I think, you know, there are potentially some small businesses who do see the administrative load that um, comes with this, with the veggie program. Um, filing a claim for nine years, there's a lot of workbooks that take place and if you don't have all of the employees to support that. Um, so again, you know, looking at this program would also lessen the administrative um, side for the business. It would also lessen the administrative side on the tax department, and I think they can, you know, sort of talk about what what that looks like for them. But um, there is there's a lot of administration that goes into the the nine years of claims that is outside of FCS. Um, so we have oversight of authorization mm -hmm. of the veggie program, but we don't have oversight over the entire life of it. It's with us for six months to a year, mm -hmm. and then it's the tax department for nine years. And then my last so question is <coughs> really changing the subject. Okay. Um, I know access to capital is going to be really hard for cannabis businesses, and I'm wondering if cannabis businesses will be eligible for this program. <laughs> uh, that is a conversation that I think, it, in terms of the traditional veggie, um, if, if the business is operating within state law, we don't have any federal in in our traditional veggie. There's no federal oversight. Um, there's no federal money involved. So that a cannabis business, in theory, would be able to apply if they can say that yes, we comply with state laws. Well, that's <laughs> just make it basic. Yeah, just veto. But it will be. It would have a problem. Thank you. In the yeah. So in this program, we'd have to. Vita has the underwriting authority, but in terms of Pepsi's role, it, and we've had some conversation with hemp producers and. Um, hemp is not cannabis. No, but that's where we're at in terms of what the state law allows now. <laughs> so in, in the federal law. What? Yeah, uh, you touched on it a little bit. Um, other than just the cost, administrative cost of the state, there's also a cost to the businesses to do this record keeping and um, mm -hmm. my understanding is that there's a lot of work that goes into it for a company to be able to, I don't know, you can explain it better than I do, whether it's individual positions or if it's individual salaries or whatever you, right. you record it. But my understanding is that one of the reasons we have big companies do it is because they've got the manpower and the ability and the wherewithal and technical expertise. Small businesses don't. And, and even if they wanted to, some of them or choose not to do it because it's just way too much for them to take on. There, you talk about that? There, so there is a lot. So the um, <coughs> this program um, is the only program that, as I understand it, tax department has a 100% verification of. Um, they verify every claim that comes in. Um, and the claims can get complicated because there are grace periods. If you miss the first year target, you have time to make up for it, but then you've got your two targets. And I mean, so it gets complicated. Um, the business has to submit um, you know, who their qualifying employees are, and there's the qualifying employees and what their wages are, are they receiving benefits, who the non-qualifying employees are, um, what their capital investments have been. Um, and there's um, an individual at the tax department who I frequently hear from businesses is their absolute favorite state employee um, <laughs> because he spends a great deal of time talking, whether it is a large business or a small business, talking <coughs> through how to do this, um, both the first year that someone is participating in the program, he has a conversation with every business about how to file a claim, and then throughout the process when he's reviewing claims, having conversations about what was submitted and, and what he's seen, verifying against um, what was submitted um, for W-2s. Um, so, it is complicated, but they're, they get a lot of assistance as needed um, in order to get through that process. But yeah, they have to submit the names of the employees, wages of the employees, 
and social security numbers. Um, if you've had, you know, if your goal is 10 employees or 10 positions um, and you've hired for 10 positions and three people left and then you hired four more people and two people left and, you know, then it gets complicated. For sure. And the second question is, is a but for, would that be applied to this program? It would be. Yeah, we've looked at, are there other ways? And um, it would still be in there. And that's, you know, while we have, um, that's why we would have the mandatory payroll increase, similar to why we have um, the background calc, the background growth calculation and the traditional veggie. Um, and that, you know, my understanding from Jeff Carr, I wasn't, I wasn't here at the time, but um, is that that was the specific reason for putting background growth in, is that well, the council um, has been selected because of their qualifications in um, business and in industry and representing uh, various areas of the state um, to look at um, the but for um, claims and, and documentation. Um, background growth was added as the, there is no crystal ball. <coughs> we put background growth saying we're not going to incentivize what this expected growth could be for the industry anyways. Um, it was sort of the belts and suspenders. Um, I, I think you were about to get into this before we started questioning, so I apologize. Um, the, uh, uh, from what I can read here, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, so the part of, you said some of the changes are based on payroll and not headcount um, uh, for criteria for determining success or whatever. Um, but it's, it's based on, um, that it, so it, the payroll it has to at least it has to increase by at least the annual increase in the employee cost index um, on or before the initial three years of the term. So I guess in relation to the but for, um, if I, I, I it feels like it would be difficult to determine if the program is if. if if the loan was necessary, if somebody is just meeting what the regular requirements of business growth would be, not requirements, but um, And there would still be the, the but for of saying, you know, what is, why are, you, why are you saying this incentive is necessary? So we still have that provision in. So whether it's um, that they're going to show that they, they just can't, that they need the capital up front in order to make these investments in order to grow. Um, or it's, you know, we're, we're being courted by other states, or we're looking at other states, um, or we're just not, we're not going to do this quickly. The but for, I think it's important to remember that it's twofold. It's not just but for this, we wouldn't do this in Vermont. Right. Um, the but for is, but for um, this incentive, we wouldn't um, do this project or would do it in a significantly less desirable manner for the state. But I, I guess I'm, I'm curious, but again, it's, it's that, I mean, the but for we can't, it's too difficult to quantify, and that's, and that's the challenge. But if we're not having, um, if we're not starting at a place of going above and beyond sort of what the reasonable expectations for a certain sector or business is, then, then it, at that point, it almost feels like we're just, and especially for small businesses, that we're just picking and choosing who's successful. I know that's not what we're trying to do here, but if, if it's just to get to the same level as what other businesses would be doing in this industry, except in this case, the state is contributing towards their success. Well, it, it wouldn't, it would be, the incentive cons is considered after that. But I so think there's after an that upfront is, piece of this. That's right, but the, and how do we, and how we calculate what the incentive will be, it's, it's after that, sort of similar to background growth rate, but we're looking at ECI. This came um, at a suggestion from Jeff Carr, and, and, and um, we had tax do an initial look at, um, you know, is this a good measure? Um, because it is a, a national measure, it takes, we're hoping some of the um, constructive criticism away from background growth or responds to that, um, that you can't be growing under that. You have to grow at least that. I think the expectation, what we would see, because you still need to benefit the state, you still have to show a net benefit in the cost benefit model. Um, so if you hit the minimum and you're not 
doing much investment, you're not going to see an incentive. So we're looking at what's a good starting point. I think we're open to the conversation of what makes sense. Right. You know, it's still absolutely. Early first day, so. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, that's our starting point. Um, uh, one of the things that the, I've been frustrated with is getting these, this sort of message out. In particular, over last year, our workforce development bill, which would allow people to collect unemployment while they're getting certification. Very few people know about that to take advantage of it. So my question for you is, especially with the, uh, the small employers of under 30 that uh, Emily mentioned, have you ever thought about taking the show on the road and going to I have regional? thought about it. Um, yeah, because uh, think about yeah. the microbreweries in the southern part of the state, they're popping up all over. Yes. I, yes. <laughs> we, and we've been talking, I think we've been having more and more conversations with our regional development corporations. Commissioner Goldstein and I have um, gone, instead of just talking to the, the directors of the regional development corporations, actually going out and talking to their board and visiting with some businesses. I think that's something we'd like to do more of, you know, candidly. In Let's addition to Veggie, we also, I, Betsy also covers TIFF. TIFF was in the news somewhat in the last year. So that was, that took some time, <laughs> um, some concentration. Um, so, you know, it's, it's. But reaching out to, you know, yeah. potential small businesses of 30 yeah. or less. And I've shared um, our white paper with the Small Business Development Center um, director on this program, talked to the director there, um, and I think, you know, part of the conversation is, you know, the assistance that small businesses need in, in navigating um, the program and, and getting the assistance, I think, is, um, and making sure that they that the correct information is also out, I think. You know, we've heard, I've heard from some folks who have said, well, I wasn't going to, you know, we haven't moved forward with the project, um, but I'm not going to leave the state. Like, well, you don't, we don't want you to leave the state. Mm -hmm. You don't have to threaten to leave the state. We don't want, you know, <laughs> don't make things up, you have, you know. But if there's a way to get this project, if you know the state is going to reinvest in you um, some of the revenue that you are creating, would that help get this project to yes? And if it would help get this project to yes, then, then this program may be good fit to you. Um, so, yeah, so the marketing, the, the getting the word out there is important and something that um, we certainly are trying to figure out how to spend more time doing it. What? Okay, the veggie program costs the state money. That's the risk because you give a cash payment back when they qualify and all the criteria is met. This would not necessarily be money from the state, it would be a loan forgiveness from PETA. So what's the risk to the state revenue for state departments if PETA is the one with the risk transfer to PETA? We are asking for an appropriation mm -hmm. um, for this program, which we don't have for the veggie program, that would go towards loan loss reserve, um, fees, um, and a uh, interest rate buy down. Um, so there, for there, for Vita, so that that appropriation will go directly to Vita. Okay. So that's the that's the state's. Um, and and Vita having a security interest in order yeah, to yeah, if the, the um, yeah. if there was a default in order to. So would the, ta the tax department recruit. would still be doing the same administrative work. The tax department would be doing less administrative work because sure. we'd be looking at payroll increase yeah. based on the yeah. the. Average wage, median, median wage um, median. increase, rather than doing a full on headcount means a yeah. full on check every person. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> this would be more cost effective for the tax, tax a more for the tax, tax department. For the tax department. I don't want to speak for them, but okay, yeah. I believe that would be an outcome that they would see. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so Megan, in I feel like we're all over the place today. Kind of Sorry. No, no, it's not your it's us, it's us. Yeah, it's, it's still work. And, and it, it might be the best for <coughs> to start thinking about letting Megan finish. And then that way um, we can get 
go completely through what she wants to tell us and then we can start digging into language and, and then figuring out the works to this whole thing. Yeah, after, after my question. <laughs> <laughs> Starting next. Uh, yeah, next. Um, <laughs> and I guess it kind of plays off what you were saying that it's kind of just focused on the mitigation risk and I was, or factor, and I was thinking about the failure of a business to meet the requirements um, and then obligated to pay to be the amount that was established in the loan. I was curious what happens in the case that, you know, the business fails to meet those requirements because it's not a good business model and then they fail and declare bankruptcy. What, how is, um, what happens to, the, to us at that point? Or the, the loan amounts that we'd already given to them. So, Movita would have the security interest, and maybe I can let Cassie. Yeah. Well, would you like me to come up? No, let's <laughs> no. <laughs> just so I, I keep think, those thoughts. Okay, okay. I'll, uh, I'll yeah. come Cassie's back. Cassie's going to come Thank up you, and testify, too. So, yeah. let's, let's, let's wait until she comes up so we can understand what Vita's role will be. Yeah. Yes. We can have that discussion with, with Vita and Emily. Plus, okay. you're all good? So this is probably a good point to take a break. And so committee back here at 11, please be prompt. And um, we'll continue on. Uh, continuing our discussion with Megan. All right, before I go back into this, just gonna make a quick pitch that the council members from the Vermont Economic Progress Council will be coming to the State House tomorrow for lunch. Um, and we would love for you all to stop by and get to meet the members of uh, uh, the council in the cafeteria. I think we're going to get there around 11.45 and we'll be there until about 1. Okay. I will have cookies available, well, <laughs> either, cookies. either homemade or doing some really great downtown economic development by purchasing them from someone. Somebody made them. Thanks. <laughs> cookies better than I do. <laughs> okay. So we'll do our best at 11.15 to 12.15. We're going to the workforce summit uh, report here downstairs, but um, after that, um, we have lunch and we'll wander up. I try to meet everybody. Yeah, that at some good. point, at some point, um, if it's possible this year or next year, we should think about um, we could bring bring the council here just to sit in with the committee and have a little roundtable discussion with them. Great. That would be really great. I think um, the council is all um, would be excited for that opportunity. I, know they're, they're I think it would be very helpful for this committee, and it may be helpful for the committee across the hallway mm -hmm. to be able to sit down and, and understand how the council actually functions and how it works and right. who the members are. And yeah. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's really good. Um, <coughs> so the second. For, and um, just before we move on to the second one, just to clarify, so this this is Vita's, in in the first program we're talking about the um, convertible loan, it is Vita's money, Vita is going to the market. Um, if the loan is converted, um, they're um, reimbursed through the tax department. Um, if the business fails, it is their, it is Vita's money. This is why we have the underwriting, so it's not the state's money that's at risk here. It's would be so Vita will go to the market to okay. provide yeah. these loans. No, 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 no. Um, yeah. But they'd be reimbursed through the tax department. Through the, so similar to how so, tax okay. currently pays the business. Because it would be taxes, the extra tax. taxes that would be. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, so same Collecting. sort of withholding yep. um, right. account. Um, so the second program we're talking about, the Vermont um, Incentive Investment Program, um, this is looking at, um, again, the, the workforce shortages in Vermont um, and the need to invest in capital to stay um, competitive. Um, the program is targeted um, at companies with over 100 employees who would be making at least $20 million in capital investments. That would be the threshold to participate in this program. Um, if they reach that um, criteria, and we know that there's um, 13 out of 14 counties, there's at least one business um, who meets that 100 employee um, threshold. 
that they could receive an incentive based on a model that's currently being worked on by Tom Cadet and Jeff Carr um, for capital investments of that up to $20 million with the um, criteria that payroll is maintained um, within 10% of where they are at the time of application. And this recognizes that our regionally significant employers are often um, multi-state or multinational businesses who are making decisions about where they're investing. Um, and if they're not investing in Vermont, what that means down the line for Vermont when they're either ready to expand and add employees or if they're looking at consolidating, con consolidation opportunities. Um, Vermont needs to be able to stay competitive with our um, regionally significant employers um, to maintain them here and invest in that capital um, here. This program would be run more like a traditional veggie program where um, payments would be made as the targets are met um, and the targets would be around that, that capital investment. I mean, something that we had talked about before was that the inclusion of these two new programs within the existing statute language muddies it a little bit. And it would be nice to separate it out and say these are two new programs, pilot programs, and this is what it looks like. Right. Uh, it might help us to really just focus on those instead of throwing everything veggie into the same consideration. Would you agree with that? Was that? I, I mean, I think so. I, Never want to create more work for David. He um, said he was bored really <laughs> Great. <laughs> Let's separate it. <laughs> I, I never remember that conversation at all. But it, it might be better right, to, I, because these are these are pilot programs, um, and I think the important factor is that we are that these are alternatives to veggie. So if a company with a hundred employees um, in one of our um, in a region is looking at doing capital investments, um, adding employees, um, aren't making $20 million worth of investment, they still can apply to veggie. Um, but really looking at if you're doing that level of capital investment and there's a decision made of which facility are we going to do this at, we want them to make that investment in Vermont. Um, because maintaining that level of payroll um, is not as significantly important for the local and state economies. So the, just, because I know we haven't worked out what the tax benefit is yet, or what the benefit, right. what the incentive is, right? So we're just saying, to create this incentive for businesses with over 100 employees investing more than $20 million yeah. in, their, in their physical plant. And now the, the benefit will be worked out. Um, right. So like Veggie, the model, um, statute says that it will use a model that's agreed upon by Joint Fiscal Committee. Um, the original model for our veggie was created by Tom Cabet and Jeff Carr. Um, that would, for this new model, those same two players are in place looking at how do we model um, this situation where we're investing in capital in order to maintain regionally important companies in the state. I, um, I don't want to say worry, but I hate to kick that can down the road. So do you, do you think Jeff Carr and Tom Cabet are close to figuring out what that might look like? Okay. I think they are. It would be, I think it would be better for us to have those parameters, especially if we have to defend it on the House floor. Yeah. And almost our colleagues to say, this is what we really think, instead of just trust right. us, we'll get back to you in a few months. And I, so I think, you know, I know um, Commissioner Goldstein is working Okay. Closely, especially on this program, on the on the convertible <coughs> loan, I've been doing more sort of the legwork on that, and I I know that we've got um, we're looking at how can, uh, modeling what um, that incentive would look like for a company and um, showing the benefit of having that upfront loan that can be converted um, as opposed to the, the long payment. So yes, I think. Okay. I know there are communications about what the, the timeline is to get that. Um, okay. But yeah, agree. What? This is a loan. This is more or less. This is what? not a loan. This no. is not. This, this is, is not like a loan. This is like a traditional thing. cash incentive. As targets are met, they would receive a, a cash incentive, or not as targets are met, as claims are filed and um, verified. 
Can you indicate what section it's done in? Because it all looks like it's kind of all intertwined. It is all intertwined. It's all it's everywhere. I mean, it's throughout. It'll throughout the. Still 641. Throughout 641, it refers to both programs throughout to talk about. You know, in this section, this is how this program will work. In this section, this is how this program will work. Yeah. See, I agree with Charlie. I think there should be one piece that talks about the small business. Another piece that talks about this. I think the yeah the original Easier thought was that there are still pieces that pull enough pieces that pull from from veggie the talking about the mandatory criteria and the process of going yeah. to the council that the original thought was to weave it in the original thought at the agency level um, was to weave it in um, but agree that it can make it hard to really look at them as individual programs so. So both of these are pilot programs? Yes. Why do we weave all of this into the statute now instead of creating these two pilot programs to see if they work? And then uh, we sunset them so that we come back and have a real conversation on evaluating mm -hmm. them. And then at that point, we would weave them in if they're working. Yeah, again, again, I think the, the thought was that there was enough similarity, there was enough pulling from the veggie statute that to just rewrite all of that in this would have been complicated, but I think if that's something we could certainly look at <coughs> is, is making them separate pilot programs instead of weaving it into statute. I think it may be easier. Maybe easier, I think. Okay. Um, also, are we looking when we look at the cap? We are asking for a um, raise in the cap. Um, and you're thinking a temporary raise for the pilot project, which is? Well, that's what I want. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, Instead of a permanent <clears throat> raise in the cap. Yeah, so I think the cap that we have suggested is instead of a $10 million cap, it would be a $25 million cap that would include all three programs. We, um, I think, once have gone to the emergency board for an increase in our cap. So that's not to say we're necessarily expecting to reach the $25 million cap, but that um, we feel comfortable with that. And I, as it is based on the benefit to the state, there I think there are questions about why we need a cap at all. Um, this is based on the net benefit to the state. But could, could you uh, talk about how often Bepsi has come against the cap? Or, you know, what percent of the annual mm -hmm. cap has been used on a yearly basis? Um, yep, and that is in our um, annual report. So, um, I think 2015, last, we... the last page of the statute as well, of the bill in front of us. Right. Okay, sorry. Um, 2015, it looks like we needed to go... Um, for an increase and 2011 and 2012, we needed to, to have the increase um, in the cap. So that's the increase... Between initial and final, you we can request the increase from 10 million to 15 million. Yeah, that's. Um, so in this pilot, we're talking about with these two different programs. You're talking about an appropriation for the first program we talked yes. about to help FIDA with administering it, and then potentially loan loan loss reserves and yeah. Um, yeah and administration. And the second is really looking at increasing the cap to go along with this program. Right. So there would be no, there's no appropriation for, for, the, second for the second program. Yeah. Okay. Everybody clear on that as we're talking about? Yeah. All right. I want to make sure. Okay. Um, I just want to clarify what I thought I heard you say okay. that um, wages would need to stay stable within 10 percent does that mean that wages could go down by 10 percent not not wages but payroll would payroll. need to stay okay. um within 10 percent 
So there could be some flux of up to 10% in payroll for, for those that meet the criteria of regionally significant 100 employees or more and $20 million worth of investments. It's not calculated on the individual worker, but overall payroll. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and there's nothing in there about median wages the way there are in the other programs? No, this is specifically Just this is specifically about maintaining our regionally um, significant employers and the capital investments that are mm -hmm. we want to happen in Vermont rather than other states. So that we don't see those losses. And uh, I, I know Doug was here earlier, but in terms of the ease of calculating that. By um, just thinking about the ease of calculating yep. the median wage, or were we talking medium or average? Me yeah, I want I need Doug to come and talk to us about what it would be good to have tax talk about what their process would be. Um, they okay. they yeah. did identify that they would they would have a process that would be a lot a lot more simplified <coughs> than what their current process is to identify the median wage and. Right, because right now you have to go employee by employee. Uh, yes, they do. Yeah. And this is overall payroll. It's just right. one line. Right. So we're. I think the, you know, the immediate thought of okay, well, what if we say you increase payroll and we're talking about the convertible loan program and the convertible loan program. We're talking about you need to increase payroll. Um, you know, one of the immediate reactions is, well, how do we know if they're not just going to give the CEOs big bonuses and there they've increased payroll? Um, that doesn't get to now. Good to have more wealth than the state throughout, but we want to see workers getting those wage increases. So the tax department has identified that they would be able to do that through a median wage review, and that would be a much more simplified process for that. Okay, any other questions for Megan? Megan, do you have more information? Yeah, on, yeah, on the second program, when you talk about so the 10% leeway on each side for payroll, again, is that? Well, 10% leeway. I mean, if they went above 10% well, increase, million, we're not going to. million dollars. Their payroll line is a right. million dollars. It includes everybody. And they go to 1.1 million. That's one temp Or you go down to 900,000. Yeah. I think the, the key of um, recapture or the, for this program would be going down. You know, if they yeah. went, yeah. If they, went if they doubled more. their payroll, we're not going to worry about it. Cut them off. Does that use the median? Does that also use the median average or whatever you use, or is that just everything? I don't mind item. I think it was the one line item that we were looking at this program, but I think I can come back to that. Wow. I'm a little confused. Why the temps on being there? Why are you worried about the upside? I think about it. 125 is I think the 10% is really about the, loss. the, the loss. Yeah. loss. Yeah. So if that, if we need to clarify that in the language, if that. That's certainly the intent. Is we're not going to be concerned if they go above. Uh, sure. Can you um, share with the committee some of the businesses that you think might have been able to invest if this incentive was here to paint a picture for us what this might have looked like uh, and retained employees instead of lost them? <laughs> There's somebody you have in mind, a, a poster child for this type of program. That... So um, there is a company that um, we're talking to who may be willing to come in and, and uh, testify about the opportunity, someone that we've met with um, in I, I larger area in Milton. Uh, right, but I, I mean, Milton. I think, again, Brett Long, Deputy Commissioner. Um, the idea of this is really targeted at the businesses such as Mac Molding, GE, uh, Husky, larger businesses that have a major presence in Vermont, but also have operations outside of Vermont and are constantly looking at investment alternatives. They're basically saying, we've got plants, in some cases all over the world, and we're trying to decide where to put the next investment dollars. We want to make sure that invest that, 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 that investment has a competitive chance of coming to Vermont. So we've got, we have someone that we're hoping is going to come in. I don't want to, okay. you know, there's certain, 
confidentiality pieces, I don't want to fully disclose without their permission of what they're looking at. But um, we do know, and, and I think, you know, again, this wasn't a, a project that we talked about when we see a plant close in, in Bennington where they've said they've made capital investments in facilities in another state. Um, you know, I think there's a question of, well, if something like this had been available, could, have the, could those capital investments have been made here? And when the, the headquarter decision is made of where we're going to focus, does that keep Vermont in the running? Surprisingly, there are no more questions. That's what happens when you leave. Oh. <laughs> I have to leave more often. <laughs> okay, Megan, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Cassie? <clears throat> Drafting a different, so it's a standalone piece. Yes. And then uh, get it back to you, just that kind of stuff. Great. Um, and the, the other piece is a follow up with, uh, I know we're going to see Tom Cabet, but talking about the time frame for that. Time frame. Yeah. yeah. We'll see, actually, he's in there this afternoon. Yeah. So we may ask a little bit about this too. <coughs> you have a, Jess, you have a pilot. What? You have a pile of questions for me. That were, were you, or were you? I, sorry. Oh, I know that I have the, for more data on the years mm -hmm. question. And you had a wage, was there a wage question? I think there was. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good follow up. Okay. Good morning, Cassie. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Thank you. <coughs> for the record, Cassie Polina, CEO of Vermont Economic Development Authority. Inviting me. Um, David already gave a pretty nice overview of VITA. Um, I'm the relatively new CEO, been here since April 1st of last year. Um, and I'm pleased to be here in support of the program that Megan has laid out. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. I do want to start by just saying that um, it may sound like semantics, but I want to highlight the importance of the fact that it's a convertible loan program, not a forgivable loan program. Mm -hmm. um, for us at VITA, um, that's important because um, I don't want our existing constituents to think that VITA suddenly has a forgivable loan program and that folks that may be running into financial difficulties could come to VITA and you know, say, oh, I heard you have this forgivable loan program and I can't make my payments. Can I have a forgivable loan now? So, um, and it's just one of those things where also, you know, traditionally when you enter into a loan con contract, um, at the beginning of the stage, you know, it's not forgivable. It's, you know, so I think that the semantics here are important that it's you achieve these goals and it becomes convertible to a grant, and that's a better way of framing it. Um, and the other important part, which Megan did clarify, is that VITA will be making these loans. These are direct loans um, on our balance sheet. This is VITA money. We are making the loans, so we are underwriting them. And this fits very nicely into what we do every single day. We do equipment financing all the time. Um, the dollar size for um, our equipment loans is probably a little bit smaller than what the numbers that you've been hearing this morning. Um, if I were to exclude, say, our solar portfolio, which is a lot of equipment loans, um, on average, it's you know, around 150,000. But it's important to keep in mind that VITA partners with other lending institutions. So we're not financing 100% of the project. We're financing, under statute, we can only finance up to 40% of the project. So we are bringing in other lenders. And I think that's also a positive for this um, potential program here because it's a way to leverage more money and get the banks and the credit unions and other lenders involved. And by having this as a low interest rate, and it's important that 
you know, I when we first started talking about this, that you know there is a an interest rate that folks that the borrowers have to pay as opposed to having there be no payments whatsoever. But at one percent, when you combine that with the bank loan, it's a very attractive blended rate. Um, so those are those are really um, positive features combined with that it's three years and then you get that conversion where I keep looking for the tax department myself where um, the money would be rebated. Um, so um, you know we think that this could work well because it would also bring um, potential borrowers to Vita that would bring other business as well. So there may be the equipment piece, but there may be other business expansion piece that would kind of follow in with that. Um, so it's, it's a natural for what we do. And um, so with that, I'm, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Um, just to ask my question that I asked Megan earlier, um, the, um, um, the risk of a of a business in this instance getting these loans, um, not achieving the payroll or capital investment standards, and then uh, then the business fails and declares bankruptcy. Um, are those the loan that we give gave them? Is that is that is that part of it, or can we create some exemptions for that bank bankruptcy? Um, like student loans, for example, can declare bankruptcy against student loans. I'm sorry, um, I'm not. Um, so, uh, anyways, can you what happens in the case where a business uh, fails and declares bankruptcy? Yep. So, uh, so it's a Vita loan. It's a direct loan. It's we've we've made that decision to loan the money. So, if the if the borrower cannot repay, that is um, our potential loss. We're going to take collateral, and and these you know we're going to underwrite these the way we underwrite every other loan that we do. So. We're not creating um, necessarily any different criteria that we would um, loosen up our credit standards, if you will. Um, so we'll take, you know, collateral, and if they declare bankruptcy, you know, we have that happen all the time. <laughs> well, Hopefully not. <laughs> it happens at t from time to time. <laughs> And we have to, you know, go through that process and recover what we can. And that's why part of the um, bill contains a million dollars. Part of that money is for loan loss reserves. Part of that money is for the interest rate subsidy because we'll lose money even if they don't declare bankruptcy. Vita will lose money at 1% because we have our costs. We have to borrow that money <coughs> at higher than one percent to lend out that one percent. So, so we need to um, make ourselves, uh, you know, keep stay in business. So there's interest rate subsidy involved, mm -hmm. and then there's loan loss reserves, and then there's the administrative costs of running the program. So normally um, we charge a one percent origination fee, and that covers our. Um, underwriting, loan closing, um, everything else, and, and that would be also included in that million dollar ask. Um, so are you concerned at all, because we're, the attempt here is to um, give these loans to smaller businesses which are more risk adverse, uh, are, you, are you, are we concerned that there's a higher, uh, that there might be more businesses in, in, in these loans that might be failing? Um, I forgot what the number of percentages of small businesses yeah, that fail is, but it's We finance high. small businesses. That's our largest volume is small businesses. We do a lot of small business lending, startups. Well, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, it's, um, but if you're uh, so there is a high, I assume there's a higher risk with a three-year payback, um, a three-year program as opposed to a nine-year program. No, there's not. Well, the way this would be structured is it's three years interest only at 1%. Yeah. The 1% requiring those payments was important in my mind because we can monitor whether they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yes, we ask for financial statements. 
most of the time we get them, some of the times we don't. But if they're not paying that 1%, then there's probably a problem. Um, so there's the monitoring involved. But this is, this is, this is what we do, um, is make loans to small businesses. So I, I'm not sure I understand. Is the question that you think that this will attract higher risk small businesses? Yes, yes. OK. Um, that could be, but we we financed other veggie sort of. We have a lot of crossover, and I don't, I don't think that it's higher <coughs> risk. Um, I'm not sure. I, I I mean we're we're going to use our same underwriting criteria, and the way that we'll underwrite it is we're going to assume that they are not going to meet that threshold, and that loan uh, that um, interest only obligation is going to convert to a regular loan that they will have to amortize over the course of what makes sense for that and if it's equipment financing it's generally the life of that equipment so it's you know five to seven years let's say that's a typical equipment loan so we're going to underwrite it based on that and if it works I mean that's that's how we look at things and and um, that's how we're going to make our decision is will it meet our underwriting criteria that we have in place already? So we're not changing any underwriting criteria to make it different for this program. And, and again, if it if isn't comfortable underwriting, if it is a higher risk when they're doing the review at the higher risk small business, that business is still welcome to apply for the traditional veggie. Right. Um, so the underwriting is not changing, but the terms are changing. Only in the sense that you've got three years of interest only. And then, and then it could convert if they meet those thresholds. If they don't meet those thresholds, it would convert into a traditional loan. Right. And that's where we're taking that risk. Right. If they haven't met those thresholds, is it because they changed their business plan and they didn't make the capital investment or they didn't hire the people, but they still have cash flow and can repay the loan. Hopefully, that's the case. If they didn't meet the thresholds and they've got other financial strain on the business, we're going to have to take a look at that from a potential workout perspective and figure out, well, maybe we need to give them longer to pay it back or take additional collateral or something of that nature. To work with them. Um, it just, this is kind of not related, but I, just because you said it, the, um, the uh, that you deal with a lot of businesses that do do fail. Um, well, I take that back. <laughs> but you, I'm just saying that it happens. They, they wouldn't be in business if that happened. Well, yeah. so that's my question: is is do we have a, do we know how much money Vita is losing? I mean, I imagine not you're not losing, but um, I, I guess. What our loss rate is, is yeah. that, okay. Or how, sure. What percentage of the businesses that you're supporting are, are not making it? Okay. Um, well, I can't answer that question, but I can tell you from a, sort of like a, like what a bank does is, is look at, you know, they have loan loss reserves mm -hmm. and they have like loss rate. And so being the type of lender that we are, um, we do take more risk than the bank. Um, so our uh, loss rate is higher than, say, a traditional, conventional bank. Um, and on our small business portfolio, it's um, a little bit higher than, um, say, our, our sub five, which is our, our largest program where we lend to um, larger businesses. But the small business, it's still pretty decent. Um, it's around 80 basis points is our loss rate, and we, our loan loss reserves, we set aside about 3% against that portfolio. So it's really not bad so at all. Um, I'm just going to jump into this one, too. So if, if we're looking at it, this is a little different animal than what you normally are looking at. And so does it make sense that businesses that, that you'd be looking at under this program, you would look, should you be looking at them the same way you would look at any other business that comes to you? Because you're kind of like a lender of last resort that 
this is a little different than that. And so should there be a little higher criteria on your approval mm -hmm. standards? Yeah, you know, I talked to Joan a little bit about this the other day, <coughs> and um, it's something I'm, I'm going to talk to my um, lending team about. Um, there may be uh, some cases and some room to, so normally we lend up to 90% on collateral, which is higher than a bank goes. Um, and that's where, and we're the subordinate lender. Um, so that's where Vita adds the value in a project, is we take that, um, and, and there's the 10% equity. So oftentimes it's really hard to make a deal work even when you know that 10% or finding that additional collateral. Um, and so that's where we might have to really sharpen our pencils on some of these deals. If, um, if it's one of these projects and um, say it's an existing business and you've got a strong primary source of repayment, say it's the cash flow, typically. So it's not a startup, but there's just a lack of collateral. That's where we may be able to say, you know what, we're going to take that extra risk. We've got the reserves from the state. So, but we have to do it case by case. You know, we've got our policy in place, and so it's got to be, you know, this is an exception, and this is, this is how we're going to look at it. We can't just sort of open the doors wide open on all of these and say we're going to, you know, throw the policy out the window because that that creates a lot of potential for losses. So it's it's really a case by case underwrite, but that's where I see the opportunity to stretch a bit on these because that's where I think the need is when you don't have the collateral and you've got an existing business. And, I don't know if permit thrush is one of these, but you know it's it's that's that's where it's really hard. Uh, Chairman, um, I, I just anecdotally, I would say that um, there's probably less credit risk than in Vita's normal pr uh, portfolio from what we have normally seen as Vita as veggie applicants. They tend actually tend actually to be um, relatively strong businesses with relatively good market share and business plans, which is why they're in the situation of being fast growing. Um, the, you know, I think probably everybody understands the problem with being fast growing is that it chews up a lot of capital. You have to buy more inventory, you have to fund uh, payables, it uses a lot of cash. So, But the, the typical veggie borrowers uh, don't go out of business, they might not grow as quickly as they thought they were going to grow and therefore not make their targets, but they typically aren't, aren't businesses that actually go out of business. Um, you acquire your money in the municipal bond market? No, we no? Um, we borrow from a couple of uh, large banks. We have a commercial paper program, and then we have another bank that we have some term debt as well as a line of credit. I'm just looking at municipal bond rates, and it's under one percent over five years. You're confident about that? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's. I mean, our. We're, we're not at 1%. Our, our um, commercial paper is our lowest, our most affordable, um, but it's all short term as well. Short term, yeah. yeah. And that's where the moral obligation that David referenced earlier, the moral obligation backs that up. Um, I just want to clarify something that you said earlier. Um, or understand the process better. Is it possible that VEPSI would approve someone and then you would not? Okay. The way this is drafted, yes. Okay, thank right. you. Right. So it could meet the VEPSI criteria, okay. but not meet the credit criteria. Thank you. Okay. What? Yeah, um, the way you describe it, if the thing isn't successful, then it converts back it to a traditional loan. And so there is a there is a risk that the business takes on as well. I mean, one of the reasons they're going through this is because they need capital and they want to get it as cheaply as they can, mm -hmm. I assume, for a small business because they need it cheap, right. as cheap as they can. Um, 
But there's other alternatives for them too. I mean, they can consolidate things. They can go and you know do all kinds of other kinds of loan options. I mean, is that something that is that correct? Again, maybe I can help there. The, yeah. the, the idea of this program is really um, to focus on the fact that the current program delays the payments for so long. Yeah. If your business is really growing quickly, you need the money now. You don't need it in eight years. So the idea is to kind of try to come up with a way to be able to help a growing business to fund the cash needs that it has as a result of the fact that it's growing now rather than way out in the future. And if their cash flow doesn't keep up with that, then that's when right. it would convert to a regular loan. I think additionally, if you know, if a, a smaller business, their incentive may be sixty thousand yeah. dollars. Sixty thousand dollars paid out over nine years isn't, you know, for a small, growing business is not um, insignificant. But yeah. I think there's more questions about you know the but for and that. But if it's up front, that really, that investment, that incentive dollar goes a lot further, and that's some of the national research that we've seen. And a question about the one percent. Uh, why one percent? Is that is is should it be more or or is it? Did you choose one percent because that's sort of a national uh, nationally other other similar programs this are charging that sort of loan that that amount it just seems like an incredibly low amount to repay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that the original discussion was zero. So I kind of <laughs> asked for something. Something. <laughs> <laughs> Cover expenses. Well, it was more the monitoring piece um, to, um, and, and you know, it's Vita does, we do loans, we don't do grants. Um, mm. And in no way to monitor that, it's hard to know what's going on. <coughs> I, I agree, and I, I, I was <coughs> thinking that 2% seems like an extremely low amount also, but if it, if there's a national model that the company was going to say, well, I'm not going to, this isn't enough to keep me here, I'm going to go to somewhere else to get a, a similar loan. Is, yeah. that, is that loan rate similar to zero or one percent or two percent? Well, again, I think it was, um, when we first started talking about this and comparing it to the existing veggie program, mm -hmm. which is all grant, there is no sort of loan component mm -hmm. of it that um, it was a compromise. So I don't think that there's a magic right. sort of behind that 1%. To, to keep this as an incentive, you know, if, it, if yeah, the, no, the I, payments get so high that it's, okay, but can, we can look can, at yeah, can, I get that. Let's, we have one presenter here, and if we have further questions for someone that's on the sidelines, we'll bring them back up. But we're starting to expand around the room and. Um, I'd rather keep this focused if we can. Thank you. Charlie? I have a <coughs> series of questions I promise to be brief. Uh, but just wondering, I know Mike used the term um, lender of last resort. That's not always true. Um, so I'm just wondering about in terms of the borrowers that you deal with, do they have to <coughs> prove that they're not able to get financing from somewhere else? No. No, okay. So the, the benefit is that they get a lower interest rate, they might get more favorable terms and a greater loan to value on whatever the collateral is, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I should caveat that. Um, we do we do borrow money from um, USDA rural development under their intermediary relending program. Yeah. And um, there is a compliance requirement in there that says that uh, the borrowers um, do have to you know say that they could not get money elsewhere, but that's not um, a huge part of what we do. Right. Okay. So, the, the so reason, we're not. I mean, we we are not the lender of last resort. So the, the reason why I ask the question is that why would a business go to a commercial bank instead of going to this program? Well, we can't. So by statute, we can only fund up to 40% of a project. Yeah. So if the request and the need, say Veggie says, okay, this applicant is eligible for 500,000, we could only finance 40% of that 500,000. We'd have to bring in a bank 
to finance the rest of it. And is that 40% the total financing package or is the total cost of the project? Total cost of the project. Okay, so they could put in 60% equity and borrow 40% from you. And does that happen yep. ever? Yep. Okay. So that's the, the re where I'm getting to is businesses that may not need this lower interest loan or that incentive might apply because they it's available. The, the second question is just in terms of the availability or the, the performance of similar programs in other places. Are you aware of or have experienced with your counterparts at other development authorities and what they've done with something like this? Not in great detail. I, one of our lenders came from Connecticut and uh, he had said that Connecticut had something similar to this, um, but I'm, I don't know in great detail the success of it and where it is. I think it's been out there for a few years, but um, I couldn't tell you um, with any real accuracy much about it. Okay. All right. Thanks. A general question about Vita. Um, just kind of trying to wrap my mind around everything you know, over the last two years. <laughs> um, what is? Uh, it feels like it, you know that that if you were in a state agency, you'd be able to do all this stuff already. Um, why are? Why is Vita a state agency? Or I, I think we're causing. Uh, what, what is your relationship with the state? So we're not an agency, mm -hmm. we, but we were created under state statute for mm -hmm. a instrumentality of the state. So we are, um, we are, uh, as David's slide showed, our board is comprised of um, five members that are ex officios right. and then ten appointed by the governor. Um, but it's actually a great model because. Um, you know, it, it, it gives us enough independence to be able to do a lot of things like borrow money from J.P. Morgan and TD Bank and make these loans and fund ourselves. Yeah. Um, well, that's what I mean. I there are strings myself. to here, you right. know. So, um, you know, I, I don't know who came up with it, but I think it's a pretty good model. It just feels like, you know, these... This is a great model, which sounds like it is. Um, and it just feels like the state is, you know, have to come to us for statutory changes to uh, provide these grants, which you guys think are, are valuable and could benefit Vermonters. Why, is, why, I mean, why even maintain that statutory relationship with the state? Well, um, I don't think that's up to me, but we do benefit from the moral obligation that the treasurer gives us. That's really a big, big thing that allows me to borrow money more cheaply ah, okay. um, and easily. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be great if I could figure out how to do that without the moral obligation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's well, just, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> That's a really good answer to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, Charlie, sorry, back to your question. Um, it's hard to know what other VITA-like entities are doing because there just aren't any that are really VITA-like. Okay. So in Connecticut, it's not a VITA-like entity that was doing this. It was more at the state level. Yeah. So if you mm -hmm. look at, like, what are other states doing, you're mostly going to be finding it at the state agency level. Um, I struggle with that one a lot. You know, what are other states doing? Uh, some of the ones that I look at sometimes to see what they're doing are like Maine has the Finance Authority of Maine. They do a lot of great things, but they get a huge appropriation from the state every year. You know, to the tune of like $10 million every single year to fund certain things that they do. Um, a lot of it is to guarantee the small business loans. They act like the SBA. Um, so it's hard to find other Vita-like entities to compare ourselves to. 
but I, I, I that's yeah. a great question because I'm always looking. So in, if I may follow up, we've asked you to get in some different things over the last couple of years, like mm -hmm. the uh, broadband loan program. Mm -hmm. And that's probably subject for a different matter, but I'd love yeah. to find that out sometime as to how that's going. But, oh, um, sure. Well, I'll give you the two-second answer. We've done one loan. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there's one more in the works. It's a little bit of a tweak on it, but we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, it's slow going. I think that the, you know, out there, the potential applicants are getting their stuff together with their feasibility studies and the CDs and yep. so um, I do think it will probably get sort of slammed with several apps all at once but right now it's all sort of percolated. I think a lot's waiting for after town meeting. Yeah. So how, um, so you've done one loan so far. So how did the vetting of that go? Well, I mean, you have to go through a process of vetting that company to make sure that it yep. it can meet its yep. obligation to you. Yep. There was, um, you know, they, um, well, it was a very small loan. Um, we were thinking that with, well, with the money that we got, that it would be all used up with maybe one, two or three applications, but the loan was only for a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, so, um, you know, we've worked out a system with um, the Department of Public Service, and they do a lot of the technical side of it to make sure it meets the criteria in the legislation as far as underserved and um, unserved, and the technology side. And we get their blessing in a certificate. Um, so that that was the vetting on. That and that's how we set it up in statute, is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Okay. And then I did a report that went to them. Uh, the commissioner read it, because it was only one loan, it was pretty short. Yeah, <laughs> but, but I mean, you go through your process of making sure the company is... All the underwriting and everything, right. yeah. Okay, good. Any more questions for Cassie? Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back. Uh, we'll come back to this next week. Um, haven't made the, the agenda yet, but we'll be working on this in 705, I think, next week.